Hello, and welcome to this, the 11th episode of Season 4 of The Dark Money Files, in which we shine a light into a murky world. I'm Ray Blake, and with me is my co-host, friend, and business partner, Graham Barrow. Hello, Graham. Hello, Ray. Well, it's time to talk PSCs then, Graham. (laughs) Persons with significant control, eh, Ray? Uh, What prompted this? As you know, two good friends of the podcast, David Leesk and Richard Smith, have recently published a detailed report on the Open Democracy website, covering the thorny aspect of the PSE reporting mechanism and its effectiveness, or, well, lack of it, maybe. They did. But, but Ray, I think before we dive into the detail, which I'm going to confess as a geek is fascinating, Mm. I think we should begin by giving uh, our audience a brief overview of the requirements of the PSE regime here in the UK. We should. And the first thing to say is that they're similar, but not the same, as the AML requirements under the Fifth Anti-Money Laundering Directive. Yeah, you're right. They are similar in respect of the requirement being that anyone who owns or controls more than 25% of the shares or voting rights in a company is a PSC. Um, but they're dissimilar in that you can include a legal person if it meets the same requirements as that of a natural person. Yeah, which is an area that we're going to talk about in a bit more detail. Mm. Uh, The rules also talk about control in a way which is similar to the AML requirements, don't they? Well, they do, Ray. Uh, You're a PSC if you can hire or fire the directors of the company or if you otherwise exercise control. And that's in addition to being one through voting or shares, of course. Mm, Yeah, and that includes through influence, although that's notoriously difficult to prove. Yeah, there's a couple of things here. One is where you have a minority shareholding, but you have familial or corporate relationships with other minority shareholders that might lead you to act in concert. Uh, Causing you to exert influence or control above the 25% threshold. Exactly. So it might look like a well-distributed shareholding until you realise that a bunch of those shareholdings are effectively controlled by one person, say a family patriarch directing his children to vote with him in their shares. Yes, and that's actually quite common. And it's also why the regulations talk about controlling directly or indirectly and why, in a Mm. complex structure, we always look to aggregate different parts of the structure owned by the same person. OK. And another situation to think about is where you don't have any formal ownership or control functions, um, but you're known to have overall influence on the direction and control of the company. Yeah, I can think of a good few examples, uh, like the business founder who relinquished all his shares, but still comes to business meetings and, and reminds everyone at the table who gave them their jobs. <laughs> but I can't imagine anyone stepping forward and nominating themselves or others as PSCs in that situation. Uh, no, but you will often hear people asserting that to be the case in respect of someone else. Yeah. Uh, if I think about the power, wealth and influence of those who I might put in that category, you know, I'm, I'm not going to name them because I can't afford to get into a legal argument <laughs> with them. Uh, So there we have it. In theory, a wide-ranging definition. In practice, quite narrow. Uh, Another quick sidebar, if I may, Graham. Oh, Ray, go ahead. Well, I wonder if it's worth discussing why we spend so much time worrying about who the owner or controller of a corporate entity is. Yeah, I suppose it's, it's pretty easy to take that for granted, isn't it? Mm. And it does need to be understood, I think, for people to go to the lengths they sometimes have to in order to complete this aspect of the due diligence. Right then. So as we know, the FATF, the Financial Action Task Force regulations and the entire basis of modern AML regulations was initially aimed at damaging the illicit drugs trade. The idea was to hit the distributors in their pockets and make it difficult, if not impossible, to enjoy the profits from their trade. 
Absolutely, Graham. And in response, the bad guys had to up their game considerably, with the aim of comprehensively disguising the proceeds of their crimes as legitimate-looking funds in the system. Now, there were two aspects to this, disguising the money and disguising the criminal. I don't mean mm. a fake wig and a, and a plastic nose. Um, <laughs> disguising the Same money. Same stripey shirt, though, Graham. Oh, you can always tell a criminal. By it. And the bag that says swag on their back. That's always a giveaway. Exactly. <laughs> um, disguising the money meant hiding it in among uh, legitimate money uh, that, the, that then enters the system and then later extracting it to spend it or invest it. Yes, and disguising the criminal was just as important. That person had to be able to control the flow of his or her money but didn't want his or her name associated with it while the processing was underway. Because if either the money looked criminal or his or her name came up, the good guys would seize the funds. Indeed. And so criminals needed to find more and more inventive ways to keep control, yet disappear from the records. And they found that corporate structures were a very good way to do that. And they still are. Uh, Most types of corporate structure uh, take a person's name off the paperwork. The name of Pablo Escobar would make bells ring, but PE Export Services Inc., not so much, Graham. No, and over the years, as the banks and law enforcement have become more sophisticated, so the corporate cloaking of individuals has become more sophisticated too. And whole industries have arisen in helping to exacerbate that. Mm. Concealing the identity of the actor remains the most crucial piece of the money laundering puzzle, and so our due diligence always starts with identifying the beneficial owners and controllers of any entity who wants to be a client. Uh, Yeah, and to have reliable control, you need to be able to own a good chunk of the entity. You can't do much with one out of a thousand shares. Uh, No, you can't, but nor do you necessarily need a majority. A sizeable minority stake plus a close relationship with key managers would do. As would a minority holding with enough other shareholders in your pocket. So that's how we arrive at 25% being generally seen as the threshold. But, to play devil's advocate here, Ray, this may make sense for companies no one has ever heard of, but do we always have to do the same for the household names? Well, not always, Graham. If they're listed on a stock market, for instance, that can be good enough sometimes, Uh, but otherwise we need the full works. That's often seen as overkill, though, isn't it? Well, yes, it is. But if you think about it, what better way to go up a league as a criminal than to be able to control a household name company and use it to launder your money? Uh, There are all sorts of ways to insert yourself into a commercial business, both legal and illegal. Yeah, if you have a lot of money, often people can't prevent you from buying shares and potentially launching a takeover bid. And the one thing the bad guys have, of course, is a lot of money. Uh, Okay, so uh, hopefully that establishes why this is really important. And now, Ray, we should talk about all those reasons why a company wouldn't legally need to declare a PSC or why it might not appear on the register. Yes, the first one's quite straightforward, uh, and that's if no one owns or controls more than 25% of the equity or voting rights in the company. Yeah, it's a situation which is true for our our own company here at the Dark Money Files, as we are composed of four equal shareholders of 25%. Thus falling one share below the reporting threshold. But in our case, as in the majority, this is because we genuinely have four equal shareholders. Hmm. It can be hard to determine sometimes whether that diverse ownership is real or merely illusory to avoid reporting. Well, yes, it can. You'll remember, Ray, we did an episode some time back when we talked about a whole bunch of newly formed limited companies, that were mainly named after volcanoes, go figure, oh, which yeah. had four equal shareholders, two from the Grenadines and two from Grenada. And there were 70 or 80 of them altogether, uh, which didn't seem entirely feasible. No, so that's the first one. Now, secondly, the company might still be determining all the information required to include the PSE details on the register. Which is okay in the short term, Graham, but shouldn't still be the case after a year or two. Well, no, I agree. That's one which needs to be looked at in line with the age of the company. Hmm. 
Now, the next one, frankly, shouldn't really be necessary. This is where the company doesn't know if it has a PSC or not and is attempting to find out. Which, honestly, Ray, if it's a newly (laughs) registered company, is a pretty strange thing. Yeah, it is. And if it's been around for a while... Um, and that's still its PSE statement, it's verging on unbelievable, really. Well, not to know who is your owner or controller, uh, yeah. (laughs) And then there's, uh, we know we have one, we're just not sure who it is. Uh, Which frankly falls into the same bucket as the previous one. Especially if that's still the declaration following the introduction of the requirement back in 2016, four years ago. Yeah, although we should add that was 2017 if you're a Scottish limited partnership. Uh, Makes all the difference, Graham. (laughs) Um, Either way, three or four years is long enough to find out. And if they were formed since then? Well, I'm not entirely sure how you form a company without knowing who your owners or controllers are. But of course, there are a couple of situations where you do know who your PSC is, but Mm -hmm. some or all of the information will not appear on the register. Yes, absolutely. I can almost hear our listeners shouting out Section 243 and 790ZF cases. Hold on. I think you're right, Ray. (laughs) (laughs) One or two may not, so I think you might need to explain. Uh, Fine. Um, Okay, then. Well, a 243 case is where a PSC, director or controller, can show that revealing their usual residential address might expose them or their families to potential physical or mental harm or abuse. Now, why might that be? Well, because they work in contentious industries, say, like pharmaceutical research involving testing on animals. Ah, I get it. So people who might be subjected to, shall we say, committed protesters? Well, that's one way of putting it, yes. (laughs) So what happens then? In a section 243, your name is removed from the register and it won't be provided to credit reference agencies, for example. But it will still be available to what are known as specified public authorities, uh, and that includes law enforcement agencies. OK, that makes sense. So, so what's a 790ZF then? Well, that's one where all your personally identifiable information is withheld from the public register, although the register will show that it's been withheld on that basis. So, for example, if you're working closely, say, with the intelligence agencies or other entities involved in national security. Well, that would be one example, yes. But other than that, a company should have made a PSC declaration and there are penalties for those who don't. Uh, Yes, there are. Now, according to the Open Democracy article, the government has issued 535 criminal proceedings against directors and another 479 against companies for failing to comply with the PSC requirements. It issued proceedings, yeah, but what happened? Well, they say 163 directors and 161 companies have been convicted and two directors have been disqualified. Two directors? Well, that doesn't sound too draconian. Um, How big's the problem? Well, do you know, Ray, here it gets a bit tricky. Now, our friends Mr Leask and Mr Smith have identified 400,000 companies who have not declared a PSC. Or rather, they have declared that they don't have a PSC, which is rather different. Well, it is. Uh, I mean, we're one of those 400,000 companies quite legitimately. Absolutely. Although if you care to look at our incorporation document, you will see that we openly declare our four equal shareholders. And that document, or possibly the annual confirmation certificate, is available for pretty much all entities, isn't it? Uh, Yes, although it's only in the case of limited companies that you'll get shareholder information as that won't apply to partnerships. Mm. And anyway, UK and Northern Ireland partnerships not Scottish, uh, Mm. are exempt from the regulations as they aren't legal entities, so they don't have to have a PSA. No, and limited liability partnerships, which are legal entities and do need to declare a PSC, don't have any shareholders, so that won't apply either. Mm. So how many companies have never made a PSC declaration, Graham? Uh, 19,000. You know, that really is a lot, given that they've had four years to do so. It is, but even here the waters are slightly muddied by the fact that Scottish Limited Partnerships that have dissolved might well circumvent the rules. Well, that's not going to matter, is it, if the partnership's dissolved? Well, yes, it does, because you can't strike a Scottish Limited Partnership, or frankly any flavour of partnership, off the register, which means even after it's dissolved, you can bring it back to life again. Really? 
Yeah, that there's one called M2M Projects LP, which has been dissolved no fewer than three times. <laughs> Three times? That seems excessive. How did they manage that? Well, on at least one occasion, according to the paperwork, they dissolved the partnership (laughs) by mistake. Or at least that's what the form says. (laughs) Okay. You'd think that was quite a difficult thing to do, wouldn't you? Uh, Fill in the form to dissolve your company and send it off to company's house in error? Uh, That's quite hard, yeah. And then there's the companies that declare a PSC... um, but which PSC doesn't meet the requirements. Yeah, now normally this is where they declare a company as a PSC, except the company's located in some offshore secrecy location, so definitely doesn't meet the transparency requirements, which are, quote, an equivalent disclosure regime to that of the UK. OK, so we're talking about quite a small number of um, jurisdictions and economies that that company has to live in then. Um mm. Do we have any recent examples where that rule isn't met? Well, yes, right. I, I've recently been having a little bit of fun monitoring the uh, fun in my world of monitoring mm-hmm. the registrations of new limited liability partnerships, which which have got connections to North and to West Africa. Yes, a whole host of new companies are being formed by people from Senegal, Togo, Guinea-Bissau, uh, Benin, and others. Yeah, but not just people, though, Ray. Well, indeed. I was working through one of the spreadsheets and spotted an LLP called Foodem Generation Group LLP, which has declared one of its PSEs to be Arts et Design, a private company incorporated in Cameroon. Mm, That definitely doesn't meet the PSC rules. And another very recent addition was Vantage Prime LLP, which has declared a Chinese national living in Australia. Which, that that fully meets the rules, right? It certainly does. No problem with that. Uh, Alongside, though, a Belizean limited company um, incorporated as a Belize international business company. And that definitely doesn't. Mm. Uh, Although, of course, any financial institution onboarding a UK entity that has faulty PSC information is now obliged to report it to Company's House. Assuming they were being onboarded to a UK financial institution, which I strongly expect these ones we've just mentioned were not. No, I tend to agree with you. Um, Why is it the companies that clearly don't meet the rules are still routinely added to the PSC register, Graham? Well, right, it's simply because Companies House does not have the mandate to reject them. And that does seem odd, doesn't it? It does, and and things were heading in the right direction following the consultation about the reform of Companies House last year, but I fear, like many things, it's been derailed by the COVID-19 pandemic. And in the scheme of things, it's hard to argue for preferential treatment. Do you know, Ray, I think that is a conundrum we'll be up against a lot over the next few months and years. Indeed. Uh, So what's next for us, Graham? Ray, we've just delivered our Dark Money Files live special on the Danske Bank story and oh, yeah. what all um, FI should have learned and implemented as a result. And we're thinking of doing it again in a more globally friendly time. So so maybe next time we'll report back on how that went, the questions we were asked and our replies to those questions and, and more. And by the time this goes out, uh, we'll also have delivered a live online session with Amy Bell of Teal Compliance, looking at the money laundering regs as they apply to lawyers and law firms and comparing this with what the banks are doing. And then there's our new project, Building on the Series of Corporate Investigations Masterclasses, in which we're turning our attention to CDD and EDD. Mm. All in all, it's pretty busy. But I think we'll be able to share some reflections on all of this in the next episode. I'm looking forward to it. 